every night? No, the Okay. Søsken måtte selge små ting på gata, ofte ting for mat, men han fikk gå på skolen de fleste dager. Og han hadde venner, og han og hans venner var bra, de var bra mot dem da de kunne spille fotball sammen. Mange av venner var i typ samme situasjon som han, så han oppfattet tidlig sitt som ganske normalt. Da han var ca. 13 år gammel, møtte familien hans en eldre lik mann, en kommandant til noen av landet. Denne mannen skulle tilby i en familie med penger, og dermed bedre liv. Og gutten skulle jobbe for han til gjengjeld. Familien var enig om denne handverk, og han fikk flyttet inn hos denne mannen. Han begynte å jobbe i mannens restaurant som renholder, men etter noen måneder måtte han øve dansetrid med en danselærer. Og ikke lenge etter det måtte han, som danser i kvinneklær, underholde mannlige gjester. Og mens svære ting skjedde, prøvde han å drømme seg bort. Tenk på fortiden, da alt var bedre. Alt som skjedde dagen før var utsydelig og uskar for han, men han kan ikke huske alt som hadde skjedd dagen før. Noe som var sikkert en lettelse for han, men med tiden begynte han å bli trist, innsluttet, fikk mye vondt i magen og hodepine. Han hadde aldri sett for seg at arbeidet skulle bli sånn. Han opplevde at han ikke hadde noe valg. Han skammet seg veldig over det han var med på om natten. Og han fryktet å dø dersom han skulle motsette seg, der man slo han, truet han og skjøtte på ham. Han ville jo fortsatt ha et bedre liv for familien sin, og mannen ga jo dem penger, han ville ikke ødelegge for dem. Noe man sa skulle skje hvis han skulle motsette seg. Han sa til gutten at hvis du fortjener foreldrene dine, så kommer de ikke til å like deg lenger. Og at de kommer til å bli sint på ham hvis han skulle vende tilbake. Men en dag tok mannen han med seg for å besøke guttenes foreldre. Gutten ville gjerne fortelle dem hva som hadde skjedd. Men mannen var til stede hele tiden. Dessuten skammet han seg veldig og fryktet følgendes reaksjon, forstår jeg også. Men følgende han skjønte at det var noe galt, siden han virket så trist og rett og annerledes enn tidligere. Så familien hans ba mannen om de kunne få noen minutter alene, bare for å si farvel. Og gutten klarte endelig å fortelle dem hva som hadde skjedd. Og faren hans brukte denne anledningen for å få ham ut av huset og ut av landet. Han skyldte fortsatt. Han har stemningsfinger, blir til tider ganske sint uten å ha kontroll, uten å vite hvorfor, til synelatene uten grunn. Han har marerikt, flashbacks, store vansker og store på mennesker. Han tenker at en stor del av barndommen hans er borte. Og han husker ikke alt fra tiden sin som Batshebazi. Forresten Batshebazi betyr bokstavlig talt gytteleken. 
Det er noe slik i tenåringer tapp seg kvinner klær å underholde at mannen er enstil. Han blir utålmodig og sint når folk ikke forstår hans indre smerter. Når noen røyker, spesielt vannpipe, så blir han kvalt. Og av og til så skjer det bare av tanken på denne lukten. Han får angst når noen hever stemmen og når det er mye bråk. Han har klart å få kontakt med familien sin, som i mellomtiden har klart å flytte til Tyrkia hos en onkel. At de er i trygghet betyr veldig mye for ham. Og at han kan være med andre ungdommer, føle at han blir tatt vare på, og at han ikke er i fare lenger, betyr at han i økende grad kan puste lettere. Mann 60, Norge. Hvorfor måtte det skje? Jeg har i alle år benekt at jeg har blitt utsatt for nedverdigende overgrep. Jeg kan ikke huske hvorfor det skjedde, eller hvorfor jeg lå det skje på en måte. Jeg vet at jeg kunne ikke gjøre noe. Jeg var jo fanget i mitt eget kropp, i mitt eget liv. Og selv om jeg vet at det er ikke sant, men så er det alltid en stemme inni meg som sier du var med på det. 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 Men hvilke muligheter hadde jeg? To, tre voksne menn. Kanskje det var flere. Alt startet da jeg jobbet på en helseinstitusjon i Oslo. Da det som er fortsatt uforståelig skjedde for over 30 år siden. Jeg ble presset mot en minibank ved Karlihansgate. Jeg ble tatt på og truet til å ta ut penger for dem. Og på en mirakuløs måte kom jeg meg med denne gangen. Jeg ble sittende på en pub i nærheten. Følte at jeg ble jakt av. Jeg drakk, og jeg drakk. Og jeg var redd. Og så var det en angang. Jeg ble ranet og slått ned ved en sidegate her i sentrum. Jeg var full. Og jeg trodde at jeg ble reddet da noen menn plukket meg opp og bært meg i en bil. Jeg ble kjørt til en leilighet ikke alt for langt unna. Vi var tre, kanskje fire menn, jeg kan ikke huske helt, men... Det jeg aldri klarer å glemme er smaken og lukten der jeg ble tatt hånd om i denne leiligheten. Det var vondt, jeg trodde jeg skulle kveles. Jeg kan ikke tilgi meg selv, fordi jeg kan ikke huske at jeg har gjort noe motstand eller at jeg sa ifra. Men alt skjedde i en tåke. Det var spytt, det var tunger, det var sær, det var en stram smak og lukt. Buksa mi ble dratt ned, og jeg ble bare stående. Jeg husker de smertene da de etter tur trengte seg inn i meg. Jeg visste at jeg kom til å dø. Det var helt utenkelig at jeg skulle overleve. Jeg bare ventet på å få dø. Og så husker jeg hjemturen. Jeg gikk, og jeg gikk. Og da jeg kom til leiligheten, jeg kastet bukser og truset i søppeljakt. Jeg dusjet og jeg dusjet igjen og igjen, men jeg ble faen meg aldri ren. 
Jeg følte at noe hadde blitt tatt fra meg ødelagt for alltid. Jeg gikk mye på pub på denne tiden. Oftest alene. Det var menn som befølte meg. Alt virket så uvirkelig. Jeg vet at jeg har blitt tatt i den samme lærligheten ved flere anledninger, der jeg ble brukt på samme måte. Jeg klarer ikke å huske at jeg har blitt slått, men det var faen meg vold. Av og til så var det bare to stykker, og jeg husker det fordi den ene prøvde å vise at han er snillere, for å forsøke å vise at han bryr seg. Bryr seg. Rommet var fylt av røyk da jeg sto der og måtte ta imot. Det var en spesiell lukt som fulgte det rommet der, ass. Og så kan jeg huske at jeg ble presset mot en murvegg ved en sidetunnel. Og da var det kun en mann. Og han holdt hodet mitt fast ved til han tømte seg i munnen min, og så forsvant han. Jeg husker dette fordi jeg møtte en kamerat fra hjemmeplassen min rett etter det. Og jeg fikk inntrykk at han så hva jeg ble utsatt for. Jeg fikk inntrykk at han så hva jeg ble utsatt for, men... Jeg hadde lyst til å grine og fortelle han alt, men jeg bare unnskyldte meg og sa jeg må hjem. Og så var det en annen gang, mens jeg var på vei mot T-banestasjonen. Jeg ble følt av to menn. Og med bestemte svitt gikk de med meg, hver på sin side. Og vi gikk, og denne turen etter å be en park med sin akerselva. Og da var jeg helt sikker på at jeg skulle dø. Men det er i stedet for brutalt voldtatt og forlatt. Jeg kan også vagt huske at jeg har blitt tatt i en bil, der det samme skjedde. Jeg klarer ikke å dra kjønnselbunnen, jeg kan ikke huske ansikt, men alle var mørkhuda. Det er det jeg husker. Og slik ble dager og uker og måneder som et mareritt for meg her i hovedstaden. Befrielsen var de gangene jeg var i hjemmebygda mi i Vestlandet. Og ikke minst samvær med min sønn. Hverdagen min var fullt av rettsinn, hav, sorg, tap, sinne, skam og skyld. Jeg kan ikke huske at jeg vurderte å si fra til politiet en gang. Det var helt utenkelig at noen skulle forstå hvordan jeg hadde det. Jeg kan huske at jeg hadde forsøkt å ta mitt eget liv. Men jeg hadde en sønn på denne tiden som gikk på barnehage, og han kunne jeg ikke forlate. Det var de helgene jeg var sammen med han som holdt meg i livet. Men jeg visste at nå kommer jeg til å dø snart. Jeg følte meg overvåket, paranoid, redd, og jeg visste ikke når det vonde skulle skje igjen. Men jeg visste at det skulle skje igjen. Men jeg kan ikke huske at jeg noen gang gledet meg til å våkne opp neste dag. Aldri. Jeg bare visste at det vonde skulle skje igjen. Ja, livet mitt er fullt av skam og skyld, men også med et håp om å kunne få dele til med noen. Og det er ikke for medlidenhet, men et håp om å kunne være hjelp til noen andre, som har også opplevd uret til livet sitt. Jeg føler jeg er på glid når jeg snakker med fagfolk på området. Jeg har også klart å fortelle mine to sønner at jeg har blitt utsatt for overgrep da jeg var i 20 år. Men det var så innmari vanskelig å sette ord på dette til de jeg er glad i. Jeg har liksom akseptert at sex og følelseslivet mitt er helt ødelagt. Ødelagt, og at jeg aldri klarer å dele livet mitt med noen.
Det er først nå at jeg har klart å presse meg selv til å feste noe på papiret. Og nå står jeg på venteliste for å bli behandlet for alle de traumene. Jeg føler meg motivert. Jeg føler meg sint. Jeg føler at jeg er klar til å ta et oppgjør med det jeg blir utsatt for. Men så kommer tvilen. Hva om du ikke blir trodd? Altså, alt virker så uvirkelig. Og hvorfor snakker om det til nå etter så mange år? Finnes det noen andre menn som har opplevd seksualisert overgrep? Hva vil mine venner si? Hva vil mitt familie si? Hva vil mine to sønner si? Hva om, hva om, hva om, hva om, hva om alt dette er en sykelig trevel som kunne finnes i hodet mitt? Jeg føler at det kan ikke strekke til. Det å strekke til er viktig, og det gir meg en følelse av mindre verdighetskomplekser. Mindre verdighetskomplekser! Og at det ikke finner noe bedring i livet, og da kommer tankene til å gjøre det slutt på alt!
push this into the next part of the So even though the topic is difficult and painful to talk about, I'm uh, happy that I can see so many uh, friends and colleagues and uh, other people that uh, we might be able to discuss this topic with throughout the evening. Thank you so much for coming. And I also want to give a big thank to everyone that has participated in uh, the development of the manuals that we have today. Uh, there are so many people to thank, so I think it's difficult. That it's like uh, it's like uh, when they're giving out the Oscars. <laughs> you know, there are so many people to thank, so it's difficult to thank them all. But uh, no mention and no one forgotten. But uh, I can see all your faces. <sighs> well, our. Uh, work on this topic started way back in 2011, but it really materialized itself when we received fund funding from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thinking back, it's mind-blowing how a small thought can develop into something that can be of value for so many. And in that regard, I would like to introduce Katarina Andersen, which is a special representative for the protection of civilians from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And after uh, she had given her little presentation, we will continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and thank you so much for inviting us here and congratulations. This is a, as an important day for you but also for us. Um, I'm very pleased to be here at the launch uh, because the complexity of sexual and gender-based violence is, violence is uh, well known to many of you here and I think the performance at the start of this evening really showcased uh, the trauma not only for that individual, but for the whole community, their family, and how this can be a lifelong impact for people. And this is why the work that you are doing and the work that responders are doing is really, it's life-saving work. And while um, it is a global problem, it's a Norwegian problem, and it's definitely a problem in conflicts and humanitarian contexts. And it affects people of all genders and all ages. And while, of course, women and girls are the majority of the survivors, and those primarily targeted, we need more attention to the fact that boys and men uh, and sexual minorities also are uh, among the affected people. And I think sometimes we are met with a sort of a false challenge, uh, that somehow looking at sexual minorities, looking at boys and men, should take away somehow from the attention that is given to women. And I think this is something that this room shows absolutely that's a false uh, narrative. And I'm very happy that we can um, bring together the knowledge we have, accepting that there is different experiences, needing different responses, and the work you're doing is very important in that regard. Uh, ever since that first manual uh, on mental health and gender-based violence and conflict was launched, it's been a tool that we have promoted with all our humanitarian partners. It's a practical tool for first responders. It focuses on mental health and the psychosocial aspects that often take the back seat to the more uh, health, uh, physical health aspects. It also looks at the responder, how facing the brutality of what survivors have gone through and how that affects them and how they still must maintain the ability to see to understand and to respond to the risks 
needs and wishes of the survivors. So this toolbox has been welcomed as guidance across the humanitarian sector and has complemented other political and operational standards and guidance. It stands out as practical and targeted. And the two new manuals focusing on children and on boys and men will certainly improve and strengthen this toolbox as you have decided to expand and deepen your methodology to survivors that are often missed and even in ignored in the established humanitarian response and discourse. So it is the stories that we were told at the beginning of this evening. It's the images from Gaza, from Israel, from Sudan, from Ukraine, and too many other places where civilians are targeted and violated. The images haunts us, but it's also what drives us to try to do more. And in conflicts where sexual violence is rampant and even used as a method of warfare, of torture, of terror, as a means of tearing apart societies, it's really important for us to stand together as humanitarians, as human rights activists, and as professional uh, health care providers, and, um, and as diplomats, uh, and I have my colleagues here with me, to do what we can to try to prevent sexual violence, keep uh, perpetrators accountable, uh, implement those norms that we have fought for, not to let them slide, even when we are met with quite a lot of resistance on the global uh, arena, and then primarily when it has happened, when we have failed in our prevention, to have these kinds of practical tools to meet people with dignity, with respect, and to try to guide them out of this trauma that they have seen. So I'm just very proud to be here, proud to support this work. Uh, this will be a continued priority for Norway in our humanitarian and human rights work. And um, I look forward to this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Katrina, and uh, we really appreciate the collaboration we have with the Norwegian Foreign Ministry and Nora, of course. Mm, we will continue with uh, the next uh, speaker for tonight. Uh, when we continued with the work that we had doing, focusing on, uh, um, on boys and men and children, we uh, was so, um, it so happened that it was in the middle of the launch of a very important report that, that the Norwegian Red Cross and the International Federation of Red Cross launched this report. And uh, uh, Maria, uh, Carolina, Isa, Isa? yes, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the report that uh, they launched in 2020? 2021, so it's more recent. Thank you very much to uh, Mental Health and Human Rights Initiative for this excellent work and this opportunity to exchange on such an important issue uh, on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. Uh, we also want to extend our gratitude to the Norwegian Red Cross and the Norwegian MFA for the continuous support to ensure holistic care for all victims and survivors, including men and boys. Uh, the ICRC, where I work, is particularly concerned about the issue of sexual violence and armed conflict, uh, including in places of detention, where men and boys are often overrepresented. Although international law unequivocally prohibits sexual violence, uh, unfortunately we see that it continues to occur and that most humanitarian responses are unable to meet the needs of men and boys affected by this type of violence. In order to really understand better where the gaps were and why we were not meeting the needs of men and boys affected by this particular violation, the Norwegian Red Cross together with ICRC carried out a piece of research that's called That Never Happens Here. And it's precisely this report that illustrates how men and boys, including LGBTIQ plus persons, uh, do in fact experience sexual violence. The data is there. The report shows uh, that there are documented cases in more than 25 conflicts globally of sexual violence perpetrated against men and boys over a 20-year period, from 1998 to 2008. 
one can imagine that those figures unfortunately have continued to increase. Similarly, we know that anywhere between 30 to 50 percent of men have disclosed experiencing sexual violence in a humanitarian crisis, particularly during situations of arbitrary arrest, detention, and also forced recruitment. And we also know that unfortunately, male survivors of torture, the vast majority, anywhere up to 80 percent, have also reported torture of a sexualized nature. <coughs> despite the data and despite the evidence, men and boys still remain invisible to this day in many different humanitarian responses and particularly those related to sexual violence. Dominant assumptions about masculinity mean that many men and boys feel they can't share their emotions. Gendered stereotypes have a harmful impact on help-seeking behavior. And we know for a fact that many men and boys are forced to resort to harmful coping mechanisms to manage their increasingly intense feelings of emotional distress. This is obviously compounded by very harmful social norms across all societies surrounding masculinity, sexuality, and the expectation that men and boys somehow do not need protection or that they could have or should have prevented the violation that they experienced. This is why accessing mental health care is so critical for men and boys to deal with the traumatic impact of these events. Many men in our research reported being dissuaded from seeking help because they realized that particularly in humanitarian settings, there was a perception that mental health support was only provided through women's groups or that it was only accessible in safe spaces for women and girls. In many humanitarian settings, this was also reinforced um, by other types of barriers to access, including sometimes legal frameworks that exclude men and boys that do not recognize them as survivors of sexual violence, who are also entitled to a holistic response. More outreach, consultation, research, and coordination with civil society actors, humanitarian actors, governments, and others are necessary to ensure that there is a gender diverse an appropriate healthcare response, and that includes mental health and psychosocial support. This is why the ICRC and the Norwegian Red Cross together really welcome the MHHRI manual. It acknowledges the unique needs of different survivors of sexual violence, but it also concretely and provides, uh, concretely and practically provides the tools to be able to address them. Um, we hope that through this manual we can continue working together as a community of academics, practitioners, and others to strengthen our support for men and boys affected by sexual violence and also ensure that the helpers are adequately equipped to meet their needs. It provides us also with an important opportunity to actively work against harmful social norms uh, and to prevent further re-victimization that so many men and boys who experience sexual violence may face when seeking help. We hope that through this manual we can begin working together to change humanitarian programming so that men and boys do not have to navigate the painful effects of armed conflict and sexual violence alone. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Carolina, and uh, I also want to mention that this uh, event is in cooperation with the Norwegian Red Cross, and they have been so generously to invite uh, Maria Carolina and Chaura uh, for this event, so we are very happy for that. Now we will continue with the work with the children's manual, and I want to invite uh, our brilliant colleague Helen Christie, who is a child psychologist and been working in this field, I won't mention how many years, but a lot of years. <laughs> and she has a lot of knowledge, and we have also some uh, of our colleagues uh, in the audience today that have participated in the writing of this manual. So we, this is um, a labor of love, and, and uh, a lot of work put into this, and uh, we are very happy to launch this manual today. So Helen? So let me start with a thankful to thank you to those who have also contributed writing this body. Did you guess that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> 
and uh, who also participated in the pilots that we have had in in Nepal, and Astrid Olsen, who also uh, did the workshop with the Ukraine. Why did we make a special um, manual for children? First of all, we, uh, when we were uh, implementing the women's work manual, many asked about what about children, what about boys and men, and what about children. Um, and it's also so that for children, the, the children's rights is different. Uh, or is specialized, and also um, we examine what kind of manuals are there already that we shouldn't copy or be a parallel to. But it's it, many good manuals about prevention from UNICEF and from WHO, but it, we didn't find any good manuals about how to help those who were exposed. So that's why we wanted to do a special manual for children. Um, we wanted it to be human right based as the others are. We want to have um, to focus on the, the psychological, not only the, the legal uh, consequences, but also the psychological consequences for the child and also for the family. Um, we wanted, we know that it's a lot of work about trauma in general, but we wanted also to specify what's special for sexual abuse. We wanted to be resource oriented, and we wanted also to include different kinds of local experiences. And yeah, we wanted to give tools, both for doing trainings, to help uh, helpers, but also tools directly for working with children. Um, yeah, um, and we wanted it to be adapted to different kind of cultures. Um, so even if it's um, written by a psychologist who have been clinicians, it's meant for for. Uh, helpers in different kind of uh, with different kind of professions. The manual is both as a as a workshop manual, so it's exercises for the participants in the workshop, but it's also the tools directly for children. It's um, it's like this. It's it has an introduction saying to whom this is for and how to use it. It's also meant to be self-explanatory. Then, we, in, in the women's manual, we, we had a um, metaphoric story, the butterfly woman story. In the men's manual, we had four cases that we, who were writing the men and boys and men manual, had met. But in this, in this manual, we actually wrote to different kind of organizations all over the world and asked for them to send cases to us. And we gathered 12 cases that is included in the manual, but we used four of them, especially for when we talk about how to understand the reactions and when we, we talk about how to help, we used these four cases as illustrating. And then we had um, in all the manuals, uh, in all the manuals we start that the most important tool is actually you as a helper. So we always start the manuals with how to be a good helper and we always start the, the workshops also with an exercise where people are expressing what they think is a good helper. And then we have, people ask for tools very, very soon, but we also think you have to know why. You have to know what you need to know and to understand about the dynamics behind the reactions and why the tools are helping. 
So we have the chapter about um, what you need to know when you are working with sexual abuse, and then we have what you need to do. But, and we have a special chapter about additional tools. And then we end up by the going back to the helper again and to see how can you take care of yourself as a helper. So that's the structure in the manual. We use the definition um, from WHO. Um, that's sexual, they talk about three different kinds of abuse. And the sexual abuse is um, defined as it occurs when a child is involved in sexual activity that is, it does not fully understand, to which it cannot give informed consent, and for which it is not developmentally prepared, or that violates the standards of the society in which the child lives. So that's the, our uh, definition. Um, and we said, your number was much higher, I think, from the Red Cross. We used a, a sort of overview that we found that at least 12.7% uh, of children have been exposed to sexual abuse. But we think the number is, of course, much higher because also, as you mentioned, boys are very seldom uh, reported. Yes. <coughs> Uh, here's the, the illustration of the good helper. We ask, when we have a workshop, we ask each little group to make a drawing of what do you think a good helper needs. Here's the one from the women's manual, and it's from Africa, I think. Congo. Yeah. Big feet, big heart, big bladder, so that you are patient and can listen long, etc. Um, yeah. And we ask these questions and we are asked uh, for a discussion in the group about what you think in your country, in your culture. What is most important here? Yep. Um, and then we have to be certain that we all agree upon the definition of trauma. That it is defined as um, a major physical or mental injury including threats to life or physical integrity or being witness to somebody close exposed. And we, we use the, the classical, that the immediate response when you are meeting danger is this fight, flight or freeze response. Yeah. But for children, it is not only the, the classical PTSD, symptoms, the avoidance, the arousal, and the intrusive memories, but it's also different from in what age are you exposed to this sexual abuse. Um, and children have different developmental tasks, so they can be disturbed. So we see that it is different uh, reactions in different age groups, that the attachment is especially, it's always affected, but it's especially um, vulnerable in the first period. And you very often see that children have a regulatory, well, regulatory difficulties, not only regulating their emotions, but also regulating their body. Uh, we see that uh, preschool children have a lot of separation anxiety, sleeping problems, and we see that then the start of that play is also so much affected. That play is some, somehow, sometimes the child is unable to play because fantasy is not really, um, reality is even worse than what the fantasy can imagine. Um, and we see sometimes the children going backwards in development, that acquired skills are reduced again. And we see this more aggressive behavior and learning problems in the uh, school children. And sometimes with teenagers, we see 
um, also with the younger children, inappropriate sexual behavior. Um, but also in teenagers we see much more guilt and shame and that they feel like they really can't identify with other adolescents. They are not similar to other adolescents. So next. <coughs> so in the need to know, we actually start with what we call the three human brain, that our brain is built from from below and up, and that in the, the lower part of the brain, we have the regulatory system, the, our breathing, our all the auto, uh, our respiration, our heart rhythm, our muscle tonus, and our bodily sensation, and then you have the the limbic system with the um, emotions and the memory. And then you have the prefrontal cortex. And we, very many people want to talk about the trauma to children. But sometimes you have to start really from regulating them, then relating to them, then talk about it. <coughs> yeah. So, it, so the, in the need to do, we start by how do you regulate, how do you um, uh, help them naming feelings, and then how can we talk about it. And uh, sexual abuse is, as I said, not only a trauma, it's a specific trauma. It has, we, in, I think in the play we saw, uh, he said something about feeling inferior. I think what my clinical experience is that sometimes you see even very strong self-hate. Uh, so it's really self-destructiveness and self-hate. And it's lack of trust because um, sexual abuse is not only an uh, invading, but it's also a betrayal. Someone you trust, someone who should protect you, are abusing you. So it's a terrible betrayal. So trust, building trust is very important because that is really being destroyed. And we see also a tendency <coughs> to be re-victimized. And I asked one of my patients to tell me why do you think this has happened from several perpetrators. And she said, it's no, it's no mystery. I freeze. I freeze every time a boy tries to touch me, I freeze. And then he sees that I won't get, uh, resist back. And we see sometimes self-destructive behavior and sexualized behavior. And we see forgetfulness and fragmented memory. That this, my life story is somehow not, I'm not able to make a coherent life story. So next. Um, and we discuss in this manual about how, how do we know, how will the child convey his story, because most people, most children don't tell, because in many, for many reasons, it's also because they have been threatened, that something will happen to them or to their parents, or, um, and sometimes the offender is also someone that they care for. So uh, they don't want to tell because they want, they don't always want a sort of revenge towards the perpetrator. And another reason is that they don't know the words. What should they say? What was this? It's not easy to, for a child to really know what is ordinary and what is seldom. And it's also that it's, it makes them discomfort uh, because remembering it, talking about it, brings it all back. And they want to be normal, and they want they need protective grown-ups. They don't want to lose their protectors, even if they hurt them. So we need really to listen, to be able to see how do they convey their story. 
sometimes in drawing, sometimes in play, sometimes in symptoms, sometimes they um, do it in writing. Many teachers have got an essay in school uh, and was, what was this? Is this something you have experienced yourself? Etc. So, um, and sometimes we know that children has a memory system that makes it more difficult for them to have a sort of what we call free recall. But they can, if they see something that's similar or they hear something that's similar, then they can start talking. Um, so, we, we practice in the workshops, we try to practice what is active listening. What is really, and it's hard sometimes when children, um, just a small example, I was reading a book for a, a girl about the bo our body, and then she suddenly said, I said, no, no, no. Mm. You know, and my head was full of questions. To whom, to what, where, and when? And I had to restrict myself and say, you said no, no, no. And she said, and he did it anyhow. And all the questions in my head had to be stopped because I just repeated and said, even if you said no, 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 he did it anyway. Yes, he put his penis into my mouth. And you, so you have to, the active listening uh, capacity is really also to hold back many of the questions that we as grown-ups have in our head. Yeah. So we do, as I said, we do, when we work with children, we work with their, their regula regulatory system, we work with breathing exercises, muscular tension exercises, playing motoric activities, etc. in order for them to get a sort of more sense, more knowing their own body. And we, um, here is a breathing exercise. Um, and we help them for instance, by making a drawing of their whole body and asking them for different colors of what is, what's the color of sadness, what's the color of being scared, what's the color of being happy. And we try to make them more bodily aware of which kind of feelings are in your body now. And where, in what kind of places do you feel more sad, more frightened, etc. And sometimes we also use screening uh, instruments, asking more direct questions, and that's sometimes possible for children if they understand that this is question posed to everybody. So it's not because it's something special with you. And um, we got a question when we wrote this from the uh, why do we in the women's manual say that you shouldn't uh, ask directly whether you are abused or not. But for children we have a duty to, to report because the abuse might be going on. So we really have to try to find out. Uh, yeah. So I included this from Atle Dyrgrom, famous Norwegian trauma expert. How do we know when trauma is, when, when, uh, when it's healed? So we have to have some, some kind of knowledge. Now this is in the past. It's when the uh, child is able to tolerate the pain and be able to memorize it. Um, when they can manage their own reactions in their body, um, when the, the, the trauma part is a, is a part of a coherent narrative, when they actually have some more self-esteem and are able to appreciate themselves, and when the most important attachment relations are re-established, and when meaning and hope for the future are established. 
I just wanted to show you. We are going to talk about implementation later. Uh, but it was a very nice experience in, in Nepal, where Lisa and I did the workshop, and also when Mari and I did the workshop in another workshop, also in Nepal in November last year. Um, and then, um, also we had, for me it was really, uh, exciting to do a training of trainers, a, a webinar with trainer of trainers, so that they now in Nepal um, have their own workshops. They are carrying on with the work that we were doing. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Helen. And uh, us who knows Helen think this was a real uh, effort for her to manage this within such a short time because this really is a manual that will we have <coughs> conducted over three days. So uh, thank you, Helen, very much. And uh, and also because of Helen's vast experience. The way she is telling about the different cases makes everything so much uh, relatable and also is more easy to see why it's so important to find ways to, to support children and support the helpers. So, next speaker is uh, Nora Seos. She is a clinical psychologist. She is our founding mother of the organization Mental Health and Human Rights Info. She also has a lot of years uh, on her back doing this work, uh, and she will present the Boys and Men Manual. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and good evening to all. It's great to see you, and it's very stimulating for us to welcome you here. And we hope and, of course, expect that you can assist us in talking about this work and also disseminating the work that we have been doing over so many years. And thank you, Hill, for presenting the manual on children, which we have been working on for a long time, and it's fantastic to see it's done. As those of you who know, the manual is also from the, the woman, the first one, which was launched actually in Geneva in 2014, and in Oslo, twice. Uh, you, you may probably recognize a lot of the elements, and you will do the same when you look at the boys and men manual that I will, I'm about to, to talk about. I also want to say that we did launch this manual in Norwegian in this very same room a year ago, also with a very strong theatre, with a strong presentation made possible by Cliff Mustache and his phenomenal team. But now we did a lot of work with the Norwegian one, making it more international. The Norwegian one was focusing particularly on <coughs> meeting, in Norwegian context, uh, survivors of sexual violence when they come as refugees and asylum seekers. The international one, of <coughs> course, is wider. It takes us to, to a broader spectrum of, of issues and contexts. But nevertheless, um, there's a lot of elements, of course, similar. And I want to thank those of you in this room now who have been working so hard to make this possible. Doris Durst, she's, she's a psychiatrist and really one of our co-collaborators in this organization. We have Sara Schoenbed, who is not here, but she was working very, very tightly with this, with this work. We have Helen, who's also worked on this one, and you, you know her already. And Harald Becklund, who was not able to be here this evening, I think, unless you have shown up. And of course Elizabeth who has been really carrying this work and, uh, and I myself have been active in, in doing this in, um, now in English. So, um, invisible boys, boys and men exposed to sexual violence, how can we support? So I want to start just by reminding you of some of the work that the HHRI is doing. And we Aside from writing manuals and trying to talk about them, arranging webinars and other different ways of disseminating this work, we are working on the, which was actually the beginning of this 
this work, namely to try to make and develop a good resource database for people who are working with survivors of, of human rights violations in war, conflict, disasters, and other emergency situations. People who are often working on the ground with very dis and very distant from experts and others who are more fully trained to do this crisis work. So our idea was to provide information, reports, uh, experiences, share all these important information with others in an easily available, accessible way. So every time, at least the, the first years we traveled around in the world, I always went to the oldest computer in the room to see if our material was accessible also on these old computers. And yes, fortunately, we made, it, made that possible. Now the world has changed and um, the, the technology, of course, a lot. But still, we have, we have to work in, in a way that makes this possible to read and to use. And as you see, we have thematic uh, di divisions in the theme. You can look into torture, specific theme. You can look into justice, transitional justice, LGBTIQ issues. All of these things are organized in a way that when looking for information, it should be easy to find and easy to, to, uh, to get hold of. So this, is, this was actually the way we started. And then we developed into more interactive work, such as the manuals. So if we go to what we're doing now, we're talking about sexual violence and sexual uh, abuse of boys and men in conflict. And even to, to say the word conflict today makes me want to cry because the situation in so many places is so terrible. We know about Ukraine, we know about Palestine, about Israel, we know about the situation in Sudan and so many, many other places. And it's so brutal. But the sexual violence that may take place also in these situations have been described and defined in many different ways. And as you see, it covers a, a wide range of sexual activities. Those of us who have been working with torture victims for many years know that male torture victims are often exposed to se sexual torture. This we know, and this we have written about in the literature. But the other kind of sexual violence abuse uh, that we have seen, for instance, in the case of of the Afghanistan boy that was presented to us in the beginning, this we have not been so aware. So what was the background for making this manual? It is, because it is, as, Helen, as both Helen and Elizabeth have mentioned, we, we were often asked, but doesn't this also happen to boys and men? And now we're so happy also to have colleagues in the room who actively have been working on this subject for many, many years, and we will meet them all in a panel shortly. So the background was, of course, to raise awareness, to remind people of what is happening. And we know from others who have been reporting on sexual violence against men, for instance, also in the UK, making reports, um, the men are often being ridiculed if they come to helpers and ask for help for these kinds of, of, of abuses. So we have to change our, at, our attitude to this. We must be made, awareness must be done that these things happen and helpers must be prepared, not start jiggling or blushing or showing an absolute incapacity to meet this in a respectful and good way. So you can move. So as you see, the, the background was the dark numbers. There's a lot here that we don't know and we probably will never be able to fully know how much and how many are affected. And we know, but we do, do know for sure that there is a very strong need to focus on boys and men, also with other ethnic backgrounds and vulnerable groups, because there may be parts of the world, cultures, countries, languages, where even talking about this is unaccepted and may lead to reprisals for the victims rather than help and support. So, we're, we're speaking about sexual violence against men and boys in war. And what do we actually know? We know that it is, it is happening, more often than we know about, even in war and conflict. There's not, not enough research, too little research. There is research. We've been looking through it, and there is, but it's still limited. But some of it is very good. There's not enough specialized help. There are taboo, guilt, and shame associated with the problem, and survivors are often reluctant to seek help. And as we have heard already from, uh, from, from you, Maria Carolina, uh, even humanitarian organizations have not been prepared. 
And of course, when you developed and when you presented the report last year in collaboration with the Norwegian Red Cross, that this doesn't happen here. First of all, the title expresses uh, the, 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 the easy way in which we neglect or even just deny the fact that it's happening. And what you're doing in this work is also describe how often humanitarian work on the field, on the ground, in different countries, uh, and you're taking specifically some countries, are not prepared as they should be. So again, we must just remind you that this is also an important report to read, and where ours is more practical, um, trying to speak to helpers, to try to support helpers in their first line work in very dramatic situations. A Norwegian humanitarian strategy has also been for many, many years very clear on fighting sexual abuse in all its forms. And now uh, it's also included in that text that we, have, we must be aware that also men and boys can be affected. Which is quite interesting also when we look back into the United Nations Security Council resolutions. There were many of them over the years. Then all of a sudden after 10 resolutions there was also the mention that our brothers may be affected as well. Which is of course an important addition. So our manual is, as uh, Helen has already mentioned, we have to make clear that we have a human rights perspective in our work. We are working with human rights abusers and we need also in our communication with survivors to communicate that they are or have been victims to abuses that are absolutely prohibited. They are and, and they can also that the acts that they have been subjected to are acts that should be punishable under international law. All of these things are important, not necessarily to speak about it all the time with, with people we work with, but to have this attitude, to have the background, that we as helpers are actually working in the human rights field with abuses of human rights, and we need to have this perspective, and we need to walk the talk all throughout our work. So as, as Helen already said, we try to be, it tries to be self-explanatory uh, by, by being, um, by describing what should be done. It also has, has a lot of room for cultural adaptations, etc. In the early manuals, we have used the metaphor, the butterfly metaphor, to, to <coughs> illustrate ways of working indirectly with, with um, the problem. This time, we have chosen five, four stories, not five stories, and I'll come back to those. And these are the main chapters of the manual. As you see, the introduction, what is useful to know. Uh, useful steps, the tools, here we try to be as concrete as possible, and also how to help a helper. We know that survivors, that, that helpers also need to be supported. You cannot work in this business, so to speak, which is so grim and so brutal over years without feeling that this also takes, takes a toll on yourself. So being aware of the helper and supporting the helper is important, and we try to raise this in all our work, including on the webpage. So the stories that we refer to are made up stories, but these, this book, this document is made by clinicians who of course have met in the clinical room a number of people with these experiences. So we have these five stories and we try to use them throughout. Use them to exemplify the symptoms, use them to exemplify the kind of trauma that people can be exposed to, and also use to exemplify how we can work with them, how we can use the tools that we describe in the, in the direct work with these. Uh, individuals who, who, will, who are representing so many throughout the world. So we have a part which is called Useful to Know, Trauma Reactions, Culture and Resilience, uh, also parallel to the Childhood Manual, and also the Tools, which is one section. And we try here to, do, to be as concrete as possible because helpers often say, yes, I want to, I understand, I, f I feel the need to help and support, but I'm so afraid of doing wrong things and I feel that I don't have the necessary tools in my toolbox. We try to provide them. It's not an ABC quick fix by all means, but it may help the helper to feel a little bit more confident and be more willing to enter this enormous and painful field. So again, helping the helpers uh, is, is uh, an issue here. Dealing with secondary traumatization, with, with fatigue, and all of these reactions that we know that helpers can have. And that we have met throughout the world when we have had our manuals, our trainings, and discussions with fantastic helpers who really are giving all their energy to support. So with these short, short minutes, I try to introduce to you 
uh, some of the elements of the manual. I hope that you will be able to look at it and download it and please also give us comments and we will come back to all of this in the panel. So thank you very much for your attention. small cultural uh, uplift now uh, from uh, some fantastic musicians. Carlos Aramidis and Louis Sucari. Is that uh, almost? <laughs> Can I please uh, take the stage? We are looking forward to hearing your music. everywhere. Not justice at all. 
ale ja z nową no, konwencją, bo jest czas konwencji. Kuda są mali.
um, are extremely proud that the three of you who are now really crunched together in the sofa. <laughs> yes, I know, you look, you look happy, all of you. Um, and of course, our wonderful host, Cliff, can be with us now and have this, this talk. What I would like to do now, very briefly, present the panelists, and then I will ask each and one of them uh, to say a little bit about their own organizations, because they're working in different contexts and working with this subject matter in a very systematic and fine way. So I want you to present that briefly, and also then, even in that presentation, start talking about how can we ensure that we can reach to those that we want to, to work with. Because as we have spoken today, the main ambition of our work is to reach helpers. Those who are out there in the front line, who are meeting survivors, meeting people who are on the run, who are finding themselves in situations of emergency, finding shelters, place to protect themselves, and in situations where it may be extremely difficult, to, to, to go to any more regular systematic help. They need support, they need help, and they need understanding where they are and where they need. So we need to support the helpers. So if you can reflect a little bit also about how can we reach out with our message when we speak about awareness and also skills and tools to help psychological first aid and all of these terms that we have. Well, having said this, I want to say first of all, welcome Sharula Tahok. You have come from UK this afternoon. You are the director of All Survivors Project. You have been working for a long time in different places on these subjects. Now you have in particular lifted the, the gender issue on sexual violence against boys and men. We met each other some months ago and we just found that we must keep together. We have a lot in common and um, you have inspired our work enormously. Thank you very much. And you, Maria Carolina Aysa, you come from Geneva also today. You work as you were introduced to the International Committee for Red Cross. And you also have been working for many years in different places, including occupied places in, Pal uh, in Palestine. You have um, worked with uh, sexual violence and uh, especially also against boys and men. And you reported, you already shared with us the report and the findings. So thank you very much for this. And um, Cliff Mustache, you are such a fine person, and I want to say that we're so proud to be with you. You are challenging the world in many ways by using art as a way of communicating, as a way of reaching out. And you have done that in a way, in Norway, that you have established this place, and you have prices, and you have upcoming prices, and this is, uh, this is really because you, you have used your, the, the speech and also alternative ways of communicating against racism, against poverty, against social injustice. And I know that you were very uh, also interested in, in spreading information about sexual violence also of, of groups where we normally don't speak about it. So again, thank you. We're very proud to have you with us. Kelly Fisher, you were working with BEFORM, which is a Norwegian-based institution or NGO and you have a very strong focus on violence against men and men's rights in more general. Uh, you organized a panel this summer in Arndals Week, which is something very famous in this room for the whole thing. And that was on, on the invisible men in war. And when I say that type of people, what's that about? And then I start, start thinking, and then, yes, of course, but I never thought about it before. You have done this, Reform is doing a great job. Helen, I think I won't use time now to introduce you. I could go on for a long time. We have collaborated for years. We have traveled around. We've tried to, to do the little we can yeah, against injustice and against violations. So I would like to start with, uh, with you, Shadow, to speak a little bit about reform. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I'll leave that to Kelly. <laughs> to All Survivors Project and the special focus of this evening. So the world floor is yours for five minutes at the most, also with some ideas about how do we reach the others. Thank you so much, Nora, and thank you to all colleagues who have invited me here. It's a very special space for, for us as All Survivors Project to be here, because it's very seldom that you find people who think alike, feel with compassion, and come together from different walks of life. Before I start to introduce the work of All Survivors Project, 
I think I speak for all the organizers and indeed the participants that this is a safe space. I understand that a lot of conversations that have happened today could be traumatic, could be triggering for all of you and some of you in particular and I hope that this is a space where you don't feel traumatized and there are experts at hand to support you indeed if you do. So All Survivors Project was born about seven years back and was born as a result of my work on human rights, particularly in the context of Sri Lanka, where 35 of the people I interviewed for a report for Human Rights Watch were men. I have no doubt that I traumatized them in my interview. I was certainly very traumatized by it. I had no experience of interviewing and working with male survivors of sexual violence. So All Survivors Project was born to set this right, to do things properly, appropriately, safely, and in the human rights framework. So we are a human rights organization, we are feminist informed, and we work in an intersectional manner. We work on three main pillars. One is access to health. Second is access to justice. The two go hand in hand. And the third is on prevention. By prevention, I'm, we don't work within communities, which is very needed, very important, essential work. But we work in building up the human rights framework, informing human rights mechanisms to take into account that sexual and gender-based gender -based violence is gendered in the very way it's inflicted. The fact that sexual violence happens against men and boys happens because they're men, because it is a tool to coerce, bully, empower, and control. It happens in a widespread manner across society, in all societies. It happens in the UK, in the context of football, in the context of the Catholic Church. It happens globally. It happens in the context of detention settings in the US, which has reported some of the highest levels of income of sexual violence against LGBTI populations. But in conflict, it becomes a particular tool, a tool that is very hard to, to really address because, as has been pointed out throughout today, Disclosures are very low. Men and boys don't speak. They don't speak because they fear stigma. They fear they will not be believed. And also, in a lot of cases, boys do not speak uh, because they know the abuse is inflicted against them because it buys silence. So what can we do, Nora, to really uh, reach these populations in humanitarian settings? One of the things that's emerging very starkly in our work in Afghanistan, in Central African Republic, in Colombia, in Syria and Turkey, and now in Nigeria, is that there is a lack of understanding. There is a lack of, so there are gaps on many levels. There is an information gap. There is an analysis gap. There is a gap in terms of monitoring, reporting. There is a gap in terms of what do we do now? The title of most of our reports is from the voices of the men who've been affected. And the main thing they say is, we do not know where to go. So the, the, the fact that humanitarian responders cannot respond to them, the men don't know where to seek access to services is one of the main issues that needs to be addressed. And how do we go about addressing this? There is no shortcut to informing communities, to really scaling up sensitization on this issue. But I think my colleague Kelly would be talking more about that. But from our perspective, health and justice go hand in hand. Access to health is access to justice, and let's not forget that. Thank you. Maybe the lack, the lack of justice may be traumatizing for people. Thank you very much. Chair, I think you summarized a lot of important points. We'll come back, back to them. So I think I'd like to ask you also now, uh, Kelly, can you, can you say a little bit about your forum and also yeah, fill in where, where our challenges are with reaching helpers and supporters? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and I just have to say first, it's really uh, an honor to be on the stage with everybody here. Uh, it's, 
uh, everything from when I first uh, heard about this handbook and I saw it uh, and read through it. It's such a, an important contribution, especially someone who has also worked uh, on the front lines when I worked on the US-Mexico border. Uh, this is the type of resource that when I look back is definitely something I needed. Uh, and also the report uh, that Maria presented about. Uh, when I saw it, I sent it to many of my colleagues. I said, uh, you don't just put this in your download folder and read it later, you have to read this. Uh, it's really groundbreaking. Also, uh, Cliff, for all of you, we were fortunate to see an excerpt of that show tonight. Uh, I saw the whole performance last year and it's quite powerful. Uh, Shadow, we've connected already quite a bit about All Survives Project. I'm excited to follow along more. Uh, so yes, lots of thank yous here. I feel like uh, now I'm in the Oscars all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> it wasn't my intention. But yes, yeah, so I work at uh, Reform. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's one of four gender equality centers here in Oslo uh, that's specifically working with men and boys on topics relating to masculinity and gender equality. And we work on a broad array of different topics. This includes everything from working with men and boys on mental health, because uh, as we know that uh, they're overrepresented in taking their own lives and less likely to seek out mental, uh, mental health help, uh, but also working with men and boys who are victims uh, of sexual violence. Uh, and we have been working on this topic for quite a while, specifically in Norway. We had a report a couple of years ago called Sed uh, Viguta, or Do We See the Boys? Uh, where we specifically looked uh, at this within the Norwegian context, and I highlight because it's also important to acknowledge that this is not just something that's helping happening elsewhere in the world, it also happens here uh, in Norway. One of the things that we highlight is that uh, that's probably around 10% of all men and boys at some point in their life in Norway will experience uh, sexual violence. Uh, it's something that we kind of concluded from our report and talking to lots of different experts and lots of literature reviews. Um, and of course this is not as prevalent as uh, with women and girls, but it is much more prevalent than a lot of people expect, and also that uh, men and boys are much less likely to receive the help or the need that they uh, need when they're seeking it out, um, as we've also heard uh, from different presentations tonight. Um, I think one of the things that we are working a lot with and how we think about this, uh, it's really important, and I kind of acknowledge this and kind of say this because of everyone that's here tonight, is that we have People here from many different uh, working backgrounds, whether that's from different ministries, from different NGOs, from students here will probably be working in lots of different relevant things. Uh, and one of the things that's really important we do is how do we nuance and rethink about uh, men and boys as vulnerable. And I think that's something that uh, every day, that if you probably listen to the news or if you look at the newspaper and you read about a humanitarian situation, uh, that you will often see women and children. And I think that it's important that we actually kind of problematize that statement because it kind of assumes that men can't be vulnerable and also then also just assumes that women can only be vulnerable and passive uh, victims. And I think this is something that both a lot of uh, feminist researchers and activists have fought against to say that women are not only just passive victims in war and conflicts, uh, that they are also agents of change, that they take action, uh, but then we also haven't done the same nuancing about women <coughs> boys in war and conflicts. Uh, I would argue. And this has important implications uh, from, there's a really important study that was done by a researcher here at the University of Oslo named Anna Katrin Kreft, uh, and she did a survey asking people um, who, like, if you had to assume uh, what percentage of men or women die in a conflict, uh, and that many people underestimated how many men die in a conflict, uh, specifically civilian men. Uh, and just an example out in the Syrian war that about 90% of all civilians who died were men, uh, which for a lot of people was quite a shocking statistic to hear. Uh, and that when they surveyed people and they found out, when they found out about that, that it kind of changed how they perceived men as also vulnerable and also changed perceptions about how we think about, uh, for example, refugee policies or who do we take in. So I kind of say this in terms of how do we support uh, those who are working on the front lines. I think I just say this here that it's really important that we also ourselves are nuancing our understandings of men and boys' uh, vulnerabilities. I realize people who are already here are interested in this topic, uh, but how we go about in our different workplaces and interact with people. Um, yes? So, so, your, so your strategy is very much really opening up eyes and, and making people aware of things that in one way should be obvious, but it's not. So, and I remember when we spoke last time, I came up with the concept masculine vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, there was research on masculine vulnerability. <laughs> was that necessary? It's, obviously, it was. Yeah. 
So yeah, so I think that's just like, uh, I could talk a lot longer, but I want to make sure that's what you're saying. So I'm kind of focusing on the awareness raising here or there, but it, if there's more time, I'll, I'll speak to more later. It's very inspiring, and I think this awareness raising and bringing up subjects which are often put aside is something that you know so well also, Cliff. So can you say some words about this place and about your, I would say, almost mandate in the Norwegian society <laughs> and, and what you do to, to touch hearts and to change minds? Yeah, I think um, first and foremost, it's just we just feel that we, we want to be part of something, of a society. We need also to feel that you belong. It's belong to something, belong somewhere. And I think that's all also brings us the focus that, okay, this is where I belong, that's where I have to contribute. So to, for us, the you Nordic know, Black Theatre, that's, I think, when we felt being apart and not belonging to where we lived, then we decided to take the matter in our hands and look at the future generation coming here to play, uh, in 20 years' time and say they need to feel they belong somewhere instead of not belonging. So that was a primary sort of goal we took. Um, and I, I think uh, that was also a much, even you have that vision, it was also a learning process as you go along. Because you're meeting people from all walks of life, cultures, backgrounds, and all of that. But the one thing is in common is the narrative that we have to share, to tell with others. And that's the thing that probably had made us the place we are today. But I'm, I, I, I'm just going to say a little thing about the, pro the process. To me, uh, I think art is, in a way, it's got its own narratives of language, its own way of expressing uh, the sentiment, the story. And when I was contacted by uh, Elizabeth Nora and Monica, uh, and then understood, I mean, I consciously know about these things are going on, but suddenly it also helped me to realize that there's so many things happening in the society and we're not able to really to share. And that was the first things that set my focus for that work which uh, your group and all that. It was quite inspiring, it was very hard, and by the way, and I thought about my community need, the men in my community need to share those stories. And it was very hard, because they, they have a kind of distance from that. And now you have to go on stage and really transform that thing, and that was a hell of a process to convince themselves. Because I said to you, I don't want you to play theater. This is documentary. This is life. This is reality. And thanks, we have a meeting with you to help them uh, to discuss the process later on. And for me, it was a learning process at all. And I think that it benefits myself and my humanity by being able to share those sort of stories if I ever got a chance, because I thought about it is so vitally important, because we heard story about, we all know, through the, uh, the society we come up about, about, about um, sexual violence against women, and we think it never happened to us. But we don't talk about it, it's a taboo. Even it happened, we don't talk about it. And suddenly we are men talking about it and sharing it together. That was, I think it was a very, impressive and inspiring journey to take and I think we're looking forward to see that you know you give me the microphone so I will talk but <laughs> I think I've seen it that but these things should not be finished in a book I am literature in academics papers but it's also we should find a way to how we bring up the school we talk presentations and then have talk with the children the, 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 uh, the, the young people, because a lot of them, they close their, their emotion, even they're going through that, and they don't want to talk about it, because if not, if you talk about it, there will be more. Nobody will believe in them. So being there in classroom and have a 15, 20 minutes of documentary feet on that, and then open up for talk, and I think that also can give education for the coming generation, the younger people too. No, it's, it's very interesting what you're saying because uh, now we had the uh, 
who, uh, while, uh, yeah, who was doing the fantastic presentation today. And last year we had two actors and, and we felt that there was really, there was a threshold or there's something that had to be overcome in order to take this on and really be it. And, and of course what we saw today, also by it, he, he was there in the room, he was the man who had been uh, pressed and had been exposed to, to this violation. And I, I, I know that it took, it, it took his soul to, to do that. And, but that means that the message is so, is so real and it, it, it gets us. Yeah. So that's... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, because when they've done that, they told me, he told me, I have to go home and, and take a shower. Yeah. I have to clean myself yeah, yeah. before I go and I have to go to the mosque after. And then I can eat. Yeah, you know, uh, it's the process of that. And I think we told him, we told him, you know, what he has done to him is a new awareness because it was difficult to get him to do the role in the beginning because of the taboos of thinking and all that. Now he's enjoying it. He feels it is important to, to tell such story. And this is really the message that we need to take out. So, Maria, I want to continue with you and thank you very much. Uh, I want to continue with you. You said a little bit about your work, but I think it would be very nice if you could add a little bit to, to it. And also, um, when you have been to the, to the different places working on these subjects, how have you managed to reach out and how can you be heard and how can they use what you try to communicate? Yeah, thanks so much, Nura. Um, so just to reiterate, um, I work at the ICRC. We're an international humanitarian organization that protects and assists people affected by armed conflict um, and other situations of violence. And uh, oftentimes it's forgotten that in addition to protecting and assisting, we also try to prevent further harm. Um, and I think that's something that I really want to stress on when it comes to sexual violence. When we speak to survivors in our work, often what comes across is not only did they experience the first violation with the moment of assault, but often disclosing is the second violation. And with every layer, it could be the third, the fourth, the fifth. And so really what we try to work on when we're working with communities is to see how we can first reduce the barriers to access and also reduce the likelihood that there is that secondary tertiary violation. Um, I think one of the ways in which we do that, so it's not just us as ICRC, we have many partners across this international movement of Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, Norwegian Red Cross is, is one of them, and often when we're working in communities, we're working with what we call the national societies, so the South Sudanese Red, Crescent, uh, Red Cross or the Ethiopian Red Cross, and many of them are volunteers who are also affected by conflict, and recently what we've been trying to do is, based on local knowledge, understanding how people talk about sexual violence, how people experience sexual violence, and then trying to take the community's knowledge and build on that um, to see how we can facilitate leaders to influence positive behavior change. So how can survivors coming forward be better supported? Um, how can they be encouraged in their help-seeking behavior? Uh, and really, what are, what are the means to do so? Um, that's one of the ways that we work across the movement and we hope to continue doing so because it is the strength of, of our response. I think what you're, what you're highlighting is, is the need also to approach survivors in different ways. Helen spoke about um, the problem of asking directly and sometimes we should not ask directly, but there's a lot of messages <clears throat> that can come across even if we don't ask it and practically and indirectly force people to speak about something that they feel as being the unspeakable. And you, you just said that, that to be forced to narrate something when, when they're not, when the time is not right, maybe just another trauma. So that's why we have in those three manuals developed the, the, the strategy of the ways of speaking in an indirect, empathic and supportive way, but without saying, I can do nothing if you don't tell all. And again, we have to, to make a difference between when do you have to talk to obtain justice, but then the, then the focus is different. And when do you have to, to talk to get help? And sometimes you don't need to talk so much to get help. And we should really clearly also discriminate between when you talk to get justice and when you talk to get help. These are two very important things that they should never be mixed. <coughs> but so thank you very much for this. I'd like to say, Helen, uh, I'm asking people how can they reach, reach those who are out in the field. And I want to go directly to, to that because right now I know that you are having some intense uh, webinars with Ukraine, and you do this with our good colleague Anna, who is sitting 
right here, who has translated, who has also the, translated the manner, uh, the manner the child manner already to Ukraine, so there she is, in there. Um, so, so I, you are actually now, not on, practically not on a daily basis, but almost, you have contact with people working on the ground in Ukraine, and you're there supporting them, talking to them, uh, providing both material from the, from the child manual, but also from, from your vast experience as a child psychologist working in, in <coughs> places of emergency. Can you say some words about how you're trying to reach out right now and what you think is happening with those who are, as we speak, working in such a dismal and, and dangerous situation? Yeah, um, I think that in, in the Ukraine, when we did the webinar in Ukraine, it was, uh, I don't really know, Anna, the, the participants was from, from a humanitarian organization, yeah, it was. Uh, but we also work with the uh, NRC, yeah, because they have a lot of, of uh, employed people in yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but excuse me, I also was had an association to Cliff because I think also we 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 cooperate with humanitarian organizations. But I think also that working with teachers or preschool teachers and working with those who meet all children are very important, both for uh, so that children can recognize that and be able to talk to someone. So that's also one arena I think it's important to reach out to. And also to parents, actually, because when we gather all these cases, these 12 cases that is in the manual, in many cases, the child tried to, to tell and wasn't believed. So, and it also in in the family, they because sometimes the perpetrator is a, a relative, so uh, telling about it is a sort of um, shameful for the family. And many times the the child is accused of being uh, the guilty one. Uh, in Nepal, we were told that uh, if there was an incest, that uh, the father abuse the child, then the father and the child are the perpetrators and the mother is the victim. So, it, you know, they, it, we really also need to work on very different levels, both in schools but also with, with family friends. Um, so in, in Nepal we also try to include the, in, we, we have done the um, um, parent guidance intervention and we tried also to include how how to treat the child, how to receive a child when if the child has been abused, how to meet the child. So I think we really have to think about very different arenas where we should be reaching out, not only to, to caregivers and also in Nepal it was the, the seven uh, organization that was a, a social organization working with in child protection, so it's many different, I think, arenas that we have to address. And yes, I was mentioning that you work now very actively uh, with Ukraine, but you have in the, in the past, not so well, this past, worked with Gaza and helpers in Gaza. So of course, the only saying that reminds us of the dreadful situation in that region for children and, and uh, well, for everybody. But um, thank you. How are we on time, Monica? Because I do have one more question to the to the <laughs> panel. You have the time to one question. One question. Fine. Because we we have looked at we have explored a little bit how can we reach out and ensure that we that what we try to communicate is reached and perhaps even found useful or useful. And I think one of the things that we've tried to do, but which is always very different, difficult, is to try to follow up after having had some webinars or some conversations or even in life training, to have follow up afterwards. Because we know that teaching and training is very inspirational when you're there, but it takes, it 
take some time to change the ways of do, doing things. So we always need to follow up and ask them, how can this be used? Is this helpful? Uh, and also it's a way of, of supporting those who are in the field, which is often a very stressful situation. So I think you have illustrated these situations very well. But, but what are the obstacles that we're facing? How can we, um, what are the worst challenges that we're seeing right now in our work? Because we do, we, we work on a human rights basis, and I usually say that if you're going to work with human rights, you have to be optimistic, because if not, you just stop working with it. You have to feel that it's useful what you do. But yes, we do find obstacles uh, and hindrances and things that make our work different. And we're trying to reach out with psychosocial support to people who have been exposed to serious violations of war and conflict, and in other peacetime as well, of course. Um, what are we facing? Do you want to start it? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a big challenge, you know, especially in our community. Uh, how can you convince them that these uh, stories are true? Uh, I think there's so many taboos, and it's just like we can't fight them, we just have to win them. So we have to find, find a way to approach them. So after a lot, so in that long run, we'll be able to convince them. I think the community is very vital, especially when a community is dominated, dominated by men. And uh, because uh, you, a man will, in certain communities, be a wrong. Some men will never want to open up for a narrative on the subject. So we men ourselves, this is how we have responsibility. So we have to enforce that those narratives is also shared between men first and foremost. And I think when you get the men with us, then I think slowly we can get a better understanding with the child and mother. I think the men are vital. First and foremost, because they, they, they are the one that has, I think they were the one who has suppressed this, the, the, their situation. So not me, I mean, they don't want to accept it, they don't want to talk about it, they're locked up, and they bring religion as, a, as an excuse, which is also important to understand the sentiment, but they want to have, want to have a way to open dialogues with them, because the symptom is there, it's just growing more and more. So I think we have a very good, a very big challenge within our own community. That's what I see. And I think in that situation that we did the play, we bring one guy who is Muslim and one other one who is different. And how we stop between them together. First, it was difficult for them to accept, even if it was a play. You know, it was, they wanted to do acting, but then we have to talk about the fact. This is a consciousness. This is, you have to be very, uh, ensure that you are going deeply, truly, to tell such story. And you can only tell if you believe in it. So, you know, these are the things that we got, particular, this is the way we work together to make that happen. And I think this is still a very big struggle, a very, very big sort of, of, of work to be done there, especially in a local community in Oslo. That's why I know very much, yes. Thank you, that's, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Charlotte, do you want to add what do you find in your work? Because you are you are actually situated in different places, not only in the UK, you're, you're in Liechtenstein, yeah, and other places. But in your work, what do you find, what are the barriers, what are the mountains to climb? I think the other side of the, the, the problem that you painted, Chris, the community and individual attitudes are social norms which are dictated by law, policy, and the government. So if you have a country which does not criminalize sexual violence against men and boys, yes. as in the, the legal framework is not gender inclusive, you have a country where health policies are gender exclusive. The sexual violence protocol in Colombia is ge gender exclusive. This is a Ministry of Health document. In Sri Lanka, sexual violence against boys under the age of 12 is not criminalized. These are important barriers. If you don't have the framework, you, you are not informed about it. And then I think there's another responsibility. And the other responsibility in terms of barriers is the funding gap. Because 
sexual and gender-based violence remains chronically underfunded in these contexts. And in these contexts, you end up with humanitarians fighting over a very small cake. So you have the contestation, constant contestation, the need for numbers. Okay, where are the men? Where are the boys? Why should we program for them? We don't have the funding. And again, coming back to the, the point that you made, Chris, about community <coughs> activism. In Central African Republic, thanks to the support of our Norwegian partners here, we did a study last year, a very small exploratory study with community-based organizations regarding reintegration of children who are associated with armed forces and armed groups. 100% of the respondents said, yes, boys are abused when they're recruited as child soldiers. 100% of the respondents said, we don't do anything about it. We don't have the funding for it. We don't have the expertise for it. We don't have the skills to make those interventions. So I think the gaps are huge, you know, starting with the legal and policy framework, which inform community and attitudes, individual attitudes. The fact that the fabric of society is so torn in these settings makes it very difficult to make interventions. And then overriding everything is the deep stigma. The self-inflicted stigma and the, and the stigma that victims and survivors also inflict on each other. So these are huge challenges that exist. Because you really described me that the, the, need, the need also to, in order to help a person individually, one has to practically go through the community because it's just in the moment that the, the community or even people who have a role in the community can have different attitude that the person himself can accept that there is another way of looking at this. And I think personally as a psychologist working with survivors of torture and, and especially sexual violence, working with their feelings of de how they're degrading themselves is perhaps the biggest thing we can do. The moment that they can look, look in, in the mirror and say that I am I and nobody has taken away my dignity. We have managed a lot, but that takes time. But this is where we are heading. Thank you very much, Shadow. Do you want to add something here? Because you have, he said some very challenging things about, about men. <laughs> um, but please, what, what do you find in your work in the reform? What are you fighting? What are your mountains? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think, uh, to put it shortly, but could always be expanded a bit more, is that uh, basically making sure that gender is not just equated to women. I think it's something that we work with a lot to make sure that when we were talking, there are many reports and many sessions I sit in on where they're like, we are using a gender perspective. And then it only talks about women and girls. And I think this is just a problematic uh, tendency that we see. And making sure that when we're talking about gender perspectives, we're thinking about uh, men, boys, girls, women, non-binary individuals, and making sure that gender is actually inclusive and recognizing uh, every, all the different identities that it encompasses. Uh, so I think that uh, in many arenas that we work with, uh, and I think specifically in this topic about sexual violence, uh, that one of the most important agendas from the UN is called the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And with that, there has been work to say that men and boys can also, uh, which is an important for those of you who aren't familiar with it, basically. It took some time, is that? <laughs> yes, it took some time, and it took a lot of uh, hard work from a lot of women and a lot of activists to say that women experience specific gender vulnerabilities in war, uh, and now on now that there is slowly kind of being added in that what are the gender vulnerabilities that men and boys are facing in war, uh, and I find that sometimes when I try and bring this into forums, sometimes within uh, women, peace, and security, it can be harder to bring that up, and I understand why, but also that it shouldn't these topics shouldn't just exist in their own silo, uh, and women's issues shouldn't just be in their own silo, but that this should be more uh, an inclusive, I guess, uh, arena to work on. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think I just wanted to touch on um, healthcare services in particular and when we talk about inclusivity, right? Um, oftentimes in our work, first of all, in the context where we're working, many healthcare systems have already been decimated. I've worked in a context where there are seven psychologists, for example, for an entire country. 
um, so already the resources are very limited. Um, but then also factor in that particularly for survivors of sexual violence in general, oftentimes there is not the training or even the supplies, the equipment to, to be able to handle these types of situations. And what we've seen very practically is that often in many countries because it's just assumed that men and boys don't experience sexual violence, where is the first point of call or the treatment area for survivors of sexual violence? It's in the OBGYN unit. It's in the women's healthcare facility. Um, I've, I've had medical staff tell us when we're going to go do assessments and, and see how we can support and strengthen care. Uh, you know, when a male survivor comes, I have to put him in the hallway because I don't know where else to receive him. I can't take him into the area where women are sitting, where female survivors are. So even thinking about these small aspects, which might seem very small, um, they actually have a major impact. And I think particularly for humanitarian actors, um, oftentimes because you know our, our experience and our, our work is really in emergency environments, to take the time to pause um, and think about if the way in which you're structuring your response is leaving someone out. And oftentimes for male survivors, the answer is yes. <laughs> That's very interesting because in many ways a story repeats itself because we've had we had the same issue with women. For instance, in the, in the, in the wars in former Yugoslavia, uh, we have had people in this room here who have been working in that in that area, and they couldn't say um, uh, women raped. They can go this door. I mean, there was no way. There was it has it had to be rewritten as it was embroidery class for women, and then <laughs> happened also to have been raped by war. So so. Now it's happening again, and of course it's, it may be even higher, uh, the problems facing the men, where to, where to go and how to formulate this in a way that it's actually accessible to them in practice. And I think this is where we have to put our heads together and give some advice to those who are in the field, because that's, they are the ones who need it. So thanks a lot. Helen, I'll give you the final word, practically the final word. What would you say would be the most problematic things to, to First of all, in many countries, I think children have, are not seen as a person. They are seen as, as their parents' property. Mm -hmm. So they don't have really the, the, rights. the, the children's rights. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one big obstacle. And also that it's, it's still invisible in many countries. When we started in Nepal, they, they said it's, and especially to young boys, they say uh, it's not happening here. It, perhaps it's happening in some hotels where tourists uh, are taking advantage of the young boys. Story, is <coughs> but not, not the elsewhere in our society. So I think the, the awareness that it is happening everywhere in every society, and that's an uh, we have to raise the awareness. And I was also, in the Ukrainian case that we got, it was also stressed very much how unprotected children are for being abused uh, in, in, in the net internet. And how many also cases of, that it starts as an uh, online uh, association, and in the Ukrainian case it was online and then it was also physical. So I think it's a, really an obstacle that we don't know what happened with children online. No, that's uh, that's that's a tremendous problem. And I think but I think what you what you raised which again I think underlines so very strongly the need to have a rights perspective because we're speaking about children's rights. And and the children to be respected as as a rights holder. Um, so that's also part of the, the communications that we need to have around the world with those who are working with children. So thank you very much, Helen. I think our time is up, but we have been discussing the ways that we can work. We, we will always be very dependent on someone who's willing to support us and to fund us. And I want to mention, and I'll come back to that list, we have people in the room who have been very supportive also in making this work possible. And I will thank you again, Liz, for especially looking at you here, because you not only have been able to, to provide funding to the work that we're doing, but also a lot of professional and experiential input to the work, which is very valuable. And others are bored and others who contribute in such a fine way. 
So that is also very inspirational. So we just must keep on working, and um, together we're even stronger. And we can work on many different levels, including art, thanks to you. Thank you so much, and thank you all for your attention. And um, thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.